Welcome to Therapist Uncensored, a podcast where therapists freely speak their minds about real life matters. All right, and this week we are going to close out our season two with a replay that I think you guys are, we think you guys are really going to enjoy. It was highly liked when we played it. Uh, I guess it's been maybe a year and a half where we are going to take a wide angle view of attachment and the stress response all across the lifespan because not only does attachment affect us as a toddler and through dating and mating it really affects us in the aging process how we handle the transition towards losing our own independence and how it affects us as caretakers of our parents so it's a really interesting dialogue. We think you're going to enjoy it if you didn't hear it the first time. And maybe a great reminder if you did. But we're really excited that we're launching our third season now. Next week, beginning of October, we're going to get going. We're, we have a lot of great things already in the can. So really, this is going to be a great year. We're confident. The break was worth it. So thank you, guys. Also wanted to announce that we're going to do a Facebook Live to launch at the very beginning. We're going to start it at October 8th at 1130 Central Standard Time. And that's a Monday. So join us maybe for a little bit of a lunch chat. The probably about 30 minutes. We'll do a live question and answer. And we'll also do a very short demonstration of a concept that we talk about quite a bit on the podcast. Sometimes we think a real visual can help with your understanding of what we're talking about. So join us there. It'll be on Facebook Live on our public page. All right. Well, let's get started. Let's start off by talking about just briefly because of the biology of attachment, because I think understanding that really impacts your understanding about how it's affected all the way through the lifespan. That's right. This isn't just uh, somebody's good idea or, you know, woo woo. If you're nice to someone, relationality, it's not that at all. Basically, the gist of the research is that even prenatally, our environment begins to affect how our system responds to stress. Absolutely. And it, Basically, the it's the science of what happens in your mind in prenatal and infancy when stress happens. We've talked about how it's actually attachment isn't about the beautiful pictures of seeing a baby being held by its mama and everybody smiling. Yes, that's bonding and that's an amazing part of child rearing. But attachment is actually what happens when that baby's a little bit of a stinker when that baby is completely distressed, crying, upset, and it's the most challenging point. And it's how that baby gets responded to at that time that is predictive of attachment. That's right. And the reason for that is that it's all about an involuntary stress response in the child. And basically the technical term for it is a HPA axis which is the hypothalamus, pituitary, and adrenal. And those interact, and the gist of it, if we are in a cal- an environment that is good at calming our little systems down and calming our butts down, <laughs> <laughs> then that basically we have a set point where that then we are able to more quickly calm ourselves down. But when we're in an environment that is threatening and that is ineffective at that, that we develop strategies to figure this out and adapt. So when you say set point, Sue, can you say a little bit more about what you mean there? Yeah, there's actually one of the most interesting and sort of easy to understand studies is that they basically take a swab of your spit, (laughs) of your (laughs) saliva, and they're measuring cortisol and upon wakening. So this isn't something that's happened and you're stressed out. And of course, cortisol is a marker of, as, as a stress response. So upon wakening, you should be not stressed, but everybody has a level of cortisol, some level. And the gist of this is that the set point is kind of what your working level of cortisol is in your body. And that can be, if it's higher, then you're going to have more startle response. It it basically begins to affect your whole biology and how, um, and also how quickly you recover after you're stressed out. So you're saying that attachment really impacts the brain and impacts your set point and impacts from infancy on how your body's baseline is. And do you wake up? Are you in an automatic response that's more feeling more threat? And that's likely where we develop an insecure attachment. And that's because the world 
you can feel is not in a secure place. So your body kind of stays in more of a set of a wait and see or watch where a set point for an infant that's developed secure attachment would be lower because they don't really have to wake up with a sense of alarm. That's exactly right. You know, and the alarm could be, this is weird, but turning off the alarm, like blocking out information in order to feel safe, or it could be really gathering information and scanning the environment to feel safe. So there's this really interesting study that looked at African-American kids and Anglo-American kids, and they were looking at cortisol, waking cortisol levels. And not surprisingly, when it was determined that they had a po- that the child had a positive relationship with their mother, everybody's cortisol level is lower. So that's not surprising. So that's a big predictor of a low cortisol set point is a strong relationship, a strong bond with the mother. Yeah, a strong attachment. Strong yeah. attachment. You feel safe. Basically, you feel secure that you're going to be watched after. That's right. And it was equal, like the... African American kids and the Anglo kids equally said that they had this, or uh, it was determined through lots of, you know, looking at from the parents' eyes and observers' eyes and what the child reported that they had positive relationship with their mom. But very interestingly, the average African American child's cortisol level was higher upon awakening, even with a positive relationship with their mother. It's likely to say quite a bit about culture and epigenetics and lots of different ways to interpret that. But that kind of brings in the element of an African-American child already has a set point that's experiencing more stress, likely. That's right. It's really interesting is how can that be? Because they have a positive relationship with their mom and it does then bring in the rest of the environment. But also, as you said, epigenetics which is that this is, and you mentioned culture, a community that has been tortured and killed and persecuted. Very and traumatized. Put into slavery and institutionally mm. oppressed, which we can imagine the threat response when there's a lack of calming and a lack of safety in the environment, then, you know, their grandparents, grandparents, grandparents have had these overwhelming threat experiences, which then we can begin to see how this ends up rolling out generationally. And it's that's the power of safety in one's environment. And it's also the power of threat in one's environment that it could, you know, the Holocaust is another example of that where the children and ch- their children didn't experience that kind of threat. But I can guarantee you that I bet their bodies have the markers of threat in their system. That makes a lot of sense. And what we're talking about is that those markers, it's not just a feeling state. It's deeply within our biological structure. That's right. It's totally involuntary. Totally involuntary. So then we have this way that another point to this is that if you do have a lot of threat in your environment, whether it's been generational, generational, or you know, in your one current environment, you have to adapt to that. So it's actually a really, what we're talking about, we call insecure. We're actually talking about a child that's actually very effectively adapting to an environment that gives off an insecure warning sign. So it's really an effective way of coping, would you say? Absolutely. And it's a strategy. So it's, you know, the way we're approaching insecure attachment is that it's a healthy strategy for a stressful situation. And what we want to do over time and what this podcast is all about is moving from that threat reaction to something that's more secure and stable and safe. And one of the ways that, of course, from childhood on to keep that cortisol level safe or lower is to keep the attachment person, the person that's really there for you, as close as possible, with as close of access to you as possible. And that's when you're talking about how we learn to adapt in our own body to do that, whether it's a strategy of shutting down and keeping quiet and not allowing ourselves to feel our own sense of... Right, particularly if it's negative state. Yes, very much so. In, or being able to have to scan the environment as in a state of preoccupied. And as that gets encoded, I guess we could say, gets encoded, it's fairly continuous throughout our life. It's, it can be fairly stable. 
That's right. And that begins to get into this lifespan approach. And there's some really great longitudinal studies. Alan Sroof is for sure somebody to call out on this, that he's had a study going since 1976, if you can believe it. Wow. He and his team, there's a whole bunch of people, but he in particular is who I'm thinking of right now. They have looked at the stability of attachment, but also the complexity of it. So it's not just a linear thing where that once you're secure, you're always secure. Or once you fall into a category that they call insecure, that's the way I'm going to say it, right? That you're always in that category, that that isn't true. That the way that they talk about it is that there's pathways. And you can be set on this pathway that is healthy, normal, what we would call normal, healthy development, when everything is optimal or optimal enough. And once you get that secure base, even when things get really hard and let's say there's a divorce or just something threatening in your environment or scary, those kids will automatically, like they they respond to the stress differently. They're more likely to reach out for help. They're more likely to receive help. All you of mean the good secure stuff. kids yep. that um, have a lower cortisol set point. That's right. The secure kids are more likely to access and be safe enough to access their environment and as- access and receive help. That's exactly right. And part of this is that the complexity comes in over the lifespan related to, so we have the set point that we've mentioned, but then on top of that, we begin to learn to think about our own thinking. We begin to learn to understand other people's intentions. We have new experiences. So sort of there's three big points. So there's the early infant caregiving situation that clearly impacts things. And clearly is is an indicator how safe you are. But as you grow up developmentally, other things start impacting what makes you feel safe in your community. As you grow up, it's it's no longer necessarily primarily based on the the mother attachment. And it shifts into the the primary as we grow older. And those of you that have children will recognize it becomes very much more focused on peer for a while that the peer are the biggest influencers of safety. That's exactly right. That's what I was getting at was that. So you've got the early caregiving and then you have the friendship networks Mm. that end up powerfully impacting. If you think of like layers on top of the set point. And so peers, especially in, you know, middle childhood and early, early adolescence, you know, we're still really being shaped. And then both of those systems, early caregiving and then uh, your friendship networks, sets up how you're going to be relating in this sort of sexual romantic nature. So it affects dating. It affects sexuality, just like even like hookups and things like that. And then and how we approach that. And then in long term partnering and who we choice, choose. choices and our satisfaction and how we resolve conflict and things like that. So that's sort of the layers that go on that. Basically, they say that once you start on a pathway, you can always change and you can always shift pathways, but that the more experiences that you have on that pathway, basically it becomes a little harder to change it over time. So how we translate that, Therapist Uncensored here, is that we want right away all of our listeners to know that you can move pathways and you had some interesting stuff about kind of what uh, some of the big antecedents were to move changing to, categories. to, move, to moving pathways right they, th- that if you mentioned if you started from a secure base that oftentimes those peers that you're around you can develop secure relationships with them and it goes on into adulthood but situational things can happen that can really throw you off that marker and actually can be deeply impacting enough that actually can switch your trajectory over from secure to insecure experiencing all of a sudden a serious serious illness in your family parental drug abuse the death of a family member, things that all of a sudden you're with. And it also obviously is also affected developmentally where you are in your lifespan about how devastating that is. But somebody that feels pretty deeply secure all of a sudden experiences something that is really suddenly disorienting and takes away their feelings of, I kind of can predict the world and know it and feel secure. It can really move you out of the set point of secure and towards a more insecure way of relating. That's right. That definitely can happen. I know that that is more rare than the other way, which is moving from insecure to secure. Right. That's the part that's really exciting. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, you talked about peer relationships or romantic relationships, and that's one of the things there's not as much research done on 
there are fewer findings of the insecure to secure. We talk quite a bit about it, but there's less actually research findings. But the ones that are really exciting, like having a highly satisfying relationship can move you from a place of insecurity to a more stable position or developing greater emotional openness along the way and therapy can happen for you or a really deep relationship with peers or friends where you all of a sudden learn how to be open and feel the safety in that and you can actually experience your set point of stress go down. That's really exciting. That is really exciting. And, you know, one of the things, and we haven't talked much about this, but spiritual relationships is something you can have a secure relationship with sort of your spiritual center or your community, that that can be a very healing, integrative place that can really move people as well. You know, one of the things also to think about, again, with this notion of that we keep layering, we start with that set point, and then we're layering relationships and layering experiences. And then the, there's a whole set of adult attachment literature that we should probably do a podcast on just just that by itself with Shaver and all of the just adult attachment, kind of the romantic relationship research. So one of the things to point out is that it's not like in our adult relationships that it's it's, it's that simple model of secure, insecure, preoccupied, all of that. Instead, if you think about it, first of all, they're voluntary relationships. <laughs> in a family, we don't get to choose, right? We're right. just <laughs> we're just born into them. But partners, we have some level of uh, choice about. So that's one of the ways that it's really different. And then the other is that it is reciprocally dependent, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's, it, we're engaged in a mutual relationship versus if you think a, a parent child relationship, that's very asymmetrical. This is a symmetrical relationship, which hopefully develops is a much safer relationship. It can be a much safer relationship because it is that way. Right. Well, it's still super co-regulated and mm -hmm. right. It can be safe or, or we can co-regulate ourselves into unsafety. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually true. So because we're so impacted and because of neural Wi-Fi, that we've got to be really careful about who we spend a lot of time with and really um, know that we're being impacted and that we're impacting both. Well, and that it's two way in that who we choose is likely going to be somebody familiar to us. And I think that's the thing that makes, for me personally, couples therapy, one of the most exciting things that I can do in my personal career. And that is... Partly because that is the, I have never seen, it's, it's such an amazing place where people can move and help each other move literally from an ins insecure place to a more secure system. That's right. And a lot of what we do, don't you think, Anne, is trying to get people to turn to each other. Mm -hmm. And I call it like catching a ball, you know, like toss me a soft ball that I can catch. Don't throw it over hand, <laughs> you know, or stick it in your pocket and don't give it to me. Right. <laughs> but we want to do something where that we're doing a soft toss that is very catchable. And then the person catches it and tosses it back. And now we have this interactive co-regulatory system that's active and helping one another. Absolutely. And if you haven't learned the soft toss, which many of us haven't, yeah. um, <laughs> and especially I think it's so important is we're talking about uh, over time that in infancy, all the way through aging, all the way through old age, one of the biggest things is how, again, we respond to stress. It's a stress response. So as you mentioned in couples, when we're tossing balls and we're slamming at each other, which <laughs> happens, we don't always soft, I don't know about you, but we don't always soft toss. Um, we Overhead can, baseball, <laughs> you know. It becomes, what is that, dodgeball? It becomes a little bit more like dodgeball sometimes. The stress response is very, very, very high. And the first thing we want to always help in our work is to recognize when your partner, and we talk a lot about that on the podcast, is actually in a stress response rather than they're just being a jerk, right? Because those can look really similar and we can emphasize the fact they're being a jerk or we can go, oh, my God, they are really, you know, wigged out with a high bit of stress. And the more we can remember that through the life cycle, it's important. But all the way through the life cycle, it's the stress response that can help actually impact us. And people together in relationships, whether it's peers or romantic, can help do a reach out. It's that it's that greater emotional openness that if I'm slamming a ball at you and instead of you slamming it back, you go, oh my God, you are really in a stressful place and you, it's a soft, calming voice. It not only can calm me down in the moment, just like we went back to the original point, it starts 
changing my neural Wi-Fi. It starts waiting. Oh, wait, I have somebody that can calm me down. It starts feeling safer in the world. And that's what we're talking about. It actually really does impact our ability to go from an insecure relating to a more secure relating. And this is throughout our entire life. Yeah, I love that. There's a phrase, lost in familiar places. Oh. Where that it's what you're saying, except the other side of it is where that we, like you might toss me a softball, but if I've had a difficult attachment history where my strategy is to defend myself in order to be okay, then I might perceive your toss as aggressive. Mm. And then I respond as if you've been aggressive, and then now we're off to the races. So that's this idea of lost in a familiar place. So yeah, it's a familiar place, but I'm lost. I'm not engaging in this mutual experience. So what we want to do is find ourselves, <laughs> maybe in an unfamiliar place, which is like, uh, like choking out uh, vulnerability, <laughs> or really taking that pause. And where this really comes into play in, and, you know, I know that we have both seen this in our own lives, is as we age, mm -hmm. and what happens in the aging process. Absolutely. Because if you think about it, during part of the aging process, that is lovely is that we actually, there is a period of time and the research shows it that for a period of time, we actually move more secure as we become less anxious about how the outside world views us and about how we're going to be received about whether our sense of purpose is being evaluated as we become less interested in other people's evaluation of us. The lovely thing about aging is we actually can develop a little bit more security in us and even actually lean towards a more healthy dismissiveness in that we become less preoccupied with other people's experience of us. Mm -hmm. like, yeah, that like I'm old enough to wear purple or whatever. That, that's yeah, yeah, I don't care yeah. anymore. Like, <laughs> yeah, it yeah, is, yeah. There's, there is some freedom. I can say personally, like, I really just don't care anymore. And there's a freedom of that that can happen developmentally. But then, of course, if we think about then continuing on that aging perspective, because we could talk so much about all of these details, but continuing on the aging perspective as one becomes more and and more compromised physically and sometimes financially and lose our our the people around us that keep us safe, you might imagine then that that stress point starts going up. Again, as, as you think about aging, I, I can think personally, I have a grandmother in serious aging condition right now. And as she had to move out of her home due to a physical injury, the level of stress and the level of her ability to feel secure in the world, it was remarkably shifted in her. And so it's so important to remember if for ourselves and for those that we love that their security set point does change. And as that changes, you will see a whole change in the way they engage in the world with you. Uh, uh, somebody that used to feel secure all of a sudden doesn't want to leave their home, doesn't want to drive, becomes more agitated. That's right. And with the population aging longer, right, that we are living longer, that we rely more on our family support networks. And in doing that, if you think about, like, again, attachment is related to some of our family experiences, then that can either be really great or sometimes that can become really problematic. Mm -hmm. So, for example... You know, sharing the burden of caretaking of an elderly person. Basically, attachment affects all of these things. It affects the vulnerability, you know, how we respond to this increasing vulnerability. It affects how we respond to the loss of a spouse. It affects our capacity to reach out. Like, you know, you were just talking about your grandmother. I, you know, as you know, my mom is also in, you know, is suffering and is aging. And, it's been interesting, you know, what you said earlier about the capacity to reach out. And she is someone who she lost her mother early on. And so she was able to, uh, again, survive and adapt to that. But one of her adaptations was not asking for help. So she would be somebody who would always say, oh, I'm feeling much better now. <laughs> or like, I don't need help. I got exactly. it. Exactly. You lose your mom at a young age. You, again, you learn to get it. It's an adaptation. Mm -hmm. But one of the lovely things is what you were saying was learning to turn to people is and, and it's these life events, birth, 
marriage, you know, birth of first child, those kinds of things, where those are those where that those transitions can happen in attachment. And the beautiful thing, going back to my mom, is that I've seen her move to a more relational place and, and be able more to ask for help. And it has been this incredible growth in our relationship that's just been really beautiful. So those of you that are caring for parents or family members, if you put the attachment lens on them too, like like going up the generation, it may help you cope with some of the uh, difficulties and, you know, the stress points, mm-hmm. or even help you understand your own, either your reluctance, you know, your mixed feelings about caring. And that can be confusing because really one of the things we all start experiencing is the shift in the attachment. It goes in reverse where we become the secure attachment for them as their security in the world starts to insecurity in the world starts to go up. Their, their dependency actually goes up. And for someone that has had a a attachment where they haven't been comfortable, like you were mentioning with your mom, not comfortable with dependency and all of a sudden she's becoming in a place of dependency, that can have a couple of different effects. But one of the ways you're doing it is you're reaching out in this really loving, warm way. And it's really beautiful because she has the chance actually, even at her age now, to experience the move towards security because of the way that you're engaging with her. Well, thank you for saying that. And I, and you know, my hope is, you know, hopefully if we can beat it through our <laughs> thick skulls, <laughs> that this is a dynamic process. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're not stuck wherever we are. And even all the way till we skid into the grave, we have a possibility of moving this. And I think that's a really good example. And your grandmother, also a really good example. And just to finish that story, she's actually moved out of the facility, back into her home, and yes. uh, is now in a more natural support environment and is uh, thriving in that situation. But when she was in a rehabilitation center for her age, she was getting care, but it was more prof- more instrumental care. And so all of her needs, it's just like if we think we talk about infants, it wraps all the way around. She was getting all her needs being and taken care of. She was in safety and just the, uh, fed but, and fed watered and, and taken <laughs> watered and all the basics. But because of the nature of a rehab center, and she, actually she had lots of family around her so that she did have lots of family around her, but it wasn't her safe environment. And I could literally see her fade away mm-hmm. and, and uh, moving home where she's surrounded by that care and love and support you see her likely blossom again. And so it's just a really beautiful indication, just something to remember. It's one of the reasons we want to do this podcast today is to remember that the process of attachment affects us from infancy all the way in, in getting into the grave, getting into the grave and to keep that in our, in our mind, whether we're the caretaker or we're the ones experiencing the loss of our own independence as we age. It's just really important to keep that compassion in understanding. That's it's so right. And like with your grandmother, I was thinking of an in infancy failure to thrive. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And it's the exact same thing. Every single need can be met on a, on an Excel spreadsheet. But the spirit or the heart begins to not continue to go on. And that literally infants that are given every single need, but not mm-hmm. the touch and the eyes and the gaze and the holding uh, can die. And they even actually call it at the rehabilitation, fail to thrive. It's failure to thrive. Yeah, it really like- is failure to thrive, but it's with our elderly. Mm-hmm. So, and there is really good research showing that emotional support, all people that are aging do better with emotional support than just instrumental support. Oh, that is so true. And you know what? I'm going to do one completely side plug here. The thing that was the most impactful is they, we had visitors to my grandmother's home over the holidays with therapy dogs and that is affecting deeply affecting our attachment capability in terms of what comes up in the oxytocin these therapy dogs came in and i have never seen the light in in these eyes of these people that had just basically glossed over and they came alive it made me very dedicated to that idea so just putting a plug you think about volunteerism all over to, to volunteer 
think about walking in and visiting the elderly because there's a deep, deep need for that warmth and the connection in that community. And it makes me think about, Anne, for those listeners who might not be in primary relationships, might not have close family, don't knock the notion of these beloved pets and the mm. impact that it can have on our stress response. Going back to that, we're going to loop back around to that right before we end here. Around that there's lots of ways to skin a cat, so to speak. <laughs> That's oh. a terrible <laughs> analogy. But there's lots of ways to do this. Uh, exactly. This gaze, this eye contact, this touch. It does not have to be human to human um, guaranteed. There's been plenty of kids that have been raised by their dogs and mm -hmm. or their pets. And that will be true again through the lifespan. And I love your example. So if you are caring for someone, just remember the instrumentality actually can sometimes even make things worse if it's only instrumentality, that you want to be sure that whoever's caring for your loved one has the heart and is making that eye contact and is touching the hand and is present and is, is providing presence. Very much like you would uh, for an infant at home, exactly. right? Exactly. You, you would That's want exactly the warm, right. the cooing, the... And so anyway, it was, I think it was so fun to talk about this from a perspective of talking about attachment all the way from infancy to the grave, because I think it really can, can really highlight for our listeners that the depth of importance and the powerful nature that we're getting into when we're talking about attachment. That's right. And just one other association I have that's similar with the infant attachment and the elderly is, you know, as we talked about earlier, the infant's brain can't regulate itself. So it's dependent on the parent or the caregiver to help do the calming. And I think that that's true then as we age as well. That mm -hmm. Especially in dementia and, and those kind of things. It, that's exactly what I was thinking. Mm -hmm. that as we lose cognitive capacity, we become, again, completely dependent. So as we're adults, we can think about what's going on and we can think about the mind of the parent and why they're either being difficult or having trouble asking for help or, or receiving it or are clingy and needy, that, that that's sort of our job is to help regulate them when they cannot regulate themselves. That's a really great point, Sue. I love it. Okay, well, thank you for listening all the way through. We're going to, as always, fill our show notes with some cool resources and uh, follow-up reading if you're interested in this. And don't forget to join us for our Facebook Live October 8th at 1130 Central Standard Time. Hope to see you there. And we would love, if you enjoy what you're hearing, we would really appreciate it if you would get on and rate and review us on your favorite podcast player that always makes a real difference for us. And we love receiving the reviews that we get and the feedback and the questions. So keep them coming because we so enjoy it. And it really does inform the directions we go. So thank you for joining us. We'll see you around the bend. Therapist Uncensored is Ann Kelly and Sue Marriott. This podcast is edited by Jack Anderson.